so much, Anthony, for inviting me to this very, very interesting workshop. I'm really enjoying the talks very much, and it is, of course, a fantastic location. Thank you very much. Thank all the other organizers, too. Of course. <laughs> In order. Okay. Um, my talk will be on XFEM. I will focus a little bit on transport models on curved crack surfaces. Before I actually start, I would like to point out where the place is where I come from, um, which is Graz in Austria, and it's not a lack of education if you don't know where that is. It is, um, Austria would be here in the heart of Europe, so to say, next to Switzerland, between Germany and Italy. So most of you will know where Vienna is, and it would be like a two hour car ride to Graz. This is Graz University of Technology, quite a nice main building, and uh, right next to this would be this building where our Institute of Structure Analysis is located. Okay, let's get started with XFEM, a short introduction to what it is, and uh, I will first start in the general framework of linear elastic fracture mechanics, and then later in part two try to adapt things for the situation in hydraulic fracturing. XFEM stands for Extended Finite Element Method. The XFEM allows for the approximation of inner element discontinuities and singularities with optimal accuracy. Like look at this sketch of some domain where we have like different materials involved. So there are material interfaces over here and also a crack path <coughs> over here. So if you want to make some analysis on this kind of domain with standard finite elements, you would definitely start with generating a suitable mesh, right? A mesh which does conform to the material interfaces, a mesh which conforms with the crack path, and of course you would want to refine your mesh near the crack tip in order to capture the singularities there. Or, I mean, if it's not linear elastic fracture mechanics, there are other interesting things going on, and in order to resolve them, you have to refine over here. Now, in XFEM, you don't have to bother about generating a conforming mesh. Okay, so the mesh generation is simple. As you can see over here, this mesh really just conforms to the boundary. So the material interfaces may be going right through the elements or the crack path is also just somewhere located within the regular normal elements. So for this reason, the XFEM is applied mostly in moving interface problems. For example, in thin phase flows, in free surface flows, in solidification applications, and I would say mostly in fracture. Yeah, but we have also applied it in all these other fields of applications, and it works just nicely there. An important thing is, although it is really mostly used in fracture mechanics, the XFEM does not include a fracture model in the sense of a model for propagation. Yeah. So it is. So the situation is still when it comes to the crack propagation, it is comparable to the situation in classical FEM. So also in this situation, assume you have generated this suitable mesh over here, which may be quite cumbersome. Now, you still have to provide answers for how does the crack tip now evolve, okay? Where does it go and how far and everything? And these questions are also not given by XFEM, okay? So that is an important thing. It really just helps you to save the time in mesh generation, yeah? which may be particularly difficult when you have moving interfaces, yeah? where you have to kind of otherwise adapt your mesh all the time. So that you don't have to do, okay? So that is what XFEM is, it's not more. Of course, when you now look at this situation here and you say, okay, now let's start. So you will have to provide like two answers. One is, the answer to the question, how do we actually define the location of these interfaces and the crack path? Because if it's no longer conforming to element edges, somehow you need to provide that information in addition, right? 
And the other is, assume you have now defined the position of these interfaces and crack paths. How to consider now for the non-smooth fields? Okay, we know that at a material interface there will be kinks in our displacement field. We know that at a crack path there is a jump in the displacement field. And we know that at the crack tip there are singularities. So how do we consider this in X? And we will address these two questions now. So the first thing, we need to somehow define the location of crack geometries uh, in addition to our mesh. We can do this in two different ways. One is implicitly based on the level set method. So assume this is our crack, and we want to define this now implicitly based on level sets. Then we introduce like one function, one level set function, which is defined everywhere, but which is zero precisely where our crack is located. Okay? It doesn't actually define the crack tips, this function here. So it is, but at least where the crack lives, that function is zero. Away from this, we it is simply the shortest distance to this function. And it is positive on the one side, negative on the other side. Classical level set context, right? Because we haven't so far covered the position of the crack tips, we need a second level set function which describes now the position of these tips. For example, that may look like this. Again, the zero level set has a, of course, the important meaning here, because that is where the crack tip is located. That was the implicit way to define crack geometries. There is also an explicit way, and that would be by simply, you know, providing an additional mesh, but now just a mesh, an independent mesh of the bulk mesh, which now defines the crack path, for example, based on line segments. Or in the 3D situation, okay, now this is our crack surface and it is now represented by, by, these, uh, by this linear surface mesh. Okay. The second thing was how to consider for the inner element discontinuities and singularities with optimal accuracy. So, the situation in linear elastic fracture mechanics, again, is we have some domain. If this is a crack path, then we know there is a jump in the displacement field along this path. And right at the tip, there is a singularity. And we say our mesh does not consider for the crack path. Okay, but now how do we consider for these inner element uh, discontinuities and singularities? We will identify those elements which are cut by the crack path and those elements which, are, which contain the crack tip. And with these elements, we kind of make a special treatment there. And what we do there is we extend the approximation space there. I mean, this is where the name... XFEM extended final element method comes from. Okay, we extend the approximation space there. So when this is the standard finite element approximation space, we shall now add some extra terms over here which refer to the jumps, and then we have some extra terms which will refer to the crack tip position and consider for the center. Okay. An immediate consequence of this is that at these nodes, which are marked over here, the nodes of the cut elements or the element containing the crack tip, they have extra degrees of freedom. Okay, this is an immediate consequence. So typical XFEM issues that we have to address are, so we have to define nodal sets for the enrichment. We have to define and evaluate enrichment functions. So if this is the correct path, we need some kind of a coordinate system over here in order to evaluate proper enrichment functions there. Enrichment functions which capture, of course, the characteristic behavior at correct tips. And we have to realize the numerical integration appropriately. So like in this 2D element, assume this is now the crack path is going this way, so this element is cut by the crack path, and therefore we have to place integration points like on the one side and on the other side, and the same thing 
in three dimensions. So then maybe this is part of a bigger crack surface now, and, and now one hexahedral element which is cut by this. So we have to place integration points on the one side and on the other side. So these are the XFM issues that we have to solve. And these issues are very nicely solved based on the level set method. So that is why level set and XFM typically belong together okay, and, and come together in one package. Okay, a typical crack simulation with XFEM, now there's no fracking so far, looks like this. So we have like, you could kind of identify three different fields. This field is for some given crack geometry. Solve in the bulk for the displacements, stresses, and strains. And this is the only part where the XFEM really goes, okay? We still have to now identify the situation at the crack front, like computing J integrals or uh, energy release rates, stress intensity factors, or something like this, these quantities, in order to then know how to update the crack geometry, like how far shall we go now at each node and into which direction, and of course, how can we modify the level set functions that define the crack geometry, actually, such that they consider for the desired crack update. And we know standard XFM is purely implicit, so there is only one crack description, and that is based on level set functions. Then, unfortunately, the modification of these level set functions, in order to consider for a certain crack update, is often a big problem. And in particular, this is the case when you go from 2D to 3D. And therefore, we propose a hybrid approach where we have both descriptions available. So we have an explicit and an implicit description of the crack geometry. And there is one master crack geometry, which is defined explicitly. That is a crack surface mesh. Okay? And that is what we need in particular over here in order to identify the situation at the crack front and in order to update the crack geometry. And only for this part where we have XFEM involved, we convert this to an implicit description based on level sets. And how this is done, I will just mention in a, in a minute. Okay, how do we now go from the one description to the other? So from the explicit to the implicit description. So we introduce like three level set functions. One is simply the distance to the crack path. So this is our explicit crack path, okay? We try to convert this to some implicit level set function, okay? We do this by distance computations and then we obtain the level set function phi one. Then there is a level set function phi two, which stores the distance to the crack tips here and there. And then there is a third level set function, which is assigned distance to an extended crack surface. So we assume that the crack path extends to infinity over here, and then we make, again, a distance computation. Of course, these two are not the same, right? So they are, in parts, similar, but nevertheless, there is a difference between phi 1 and phi 3. The nice thing here is this extends very straightforwardly to the three-dimensional situation, so they assume this is our explicit crack surface. Now we compute one level set function which gives us the shortest distance to this crack surface, and I just plotted now an, an, iso, an iso surface of this level set function. Okay, this kind of looks like a hull. Okay, every point on this hull has the same distance to this explicit crack surface. We have phi two being the distance to the crack front. Yeah, that looks like this tube-like behavior. So every point on this tube has the same distance to the crack front. Okay, so N4, 5, 3, this was the distance to the extended crack surface. So therefore, we have to kind of extend this crack surface. Okay, but there is a very straightforward procedure to do so. Okay, we simply compute average normal vectors 
uh, for every point here at the crack front, and then we compute then we compute some average tangential vector vectors along this along this crack front, and then we build the cross product, and then we get like the the co-normal vectors, which are these red. Uh, arrows over here, and then we know, okay, in this direction would be our extended crack surface. Okay, we can kind of say recently, we can say this is extended to infinity. And now we can again compute now the distance to this extended crack surface, so these are now some isosurfaces from 5 to. Okay, then, once we have these level set functions, then they imply the the, the, the Required coordinate systems immediately. So if I want to have some coordinate system A B over here, then I would simply compute this based on my level set functions. And the same if I wanted to have some polar coordinate system uh, referring to the crack tips. Remember, I need those coordinate systems in order to evaluate now the enrichment functions. And the enrichment functions they capture the characteristic behavior at the crack tip. These would be like the common, commonly used enrichment functions for the case of linear elastic fracture mechanics. Typically these four are used and now you can simply see how they look like if you evaluate them in these special coordinate systems implied by the level set functions. Okay, of course in practice, so we, we can say there are analytical level set functions for a given crack, for a given explicit crack surface, but somehow, of course, numerically, we will have to evaluate those analytical level set functions at, you know, at a finite number of points, which are the nodes of our mesh. In that sense, these are, we are actually using um, the approximated level set functions phi 1, phi 2, phi 3. Okay. So now everything would be clear for computing displacement stresses and strains very accurately with a mesh which does not at all consider for the crack geometry but with the proper enrichment functions installed. Okay, now then the other thing is, and this is not an XFM issue, this is a this is a task I could kind of I could raise this question with any other finite element. Uh, Simulation in the context of crack propagation, like at each node on my on my crack front, where to go and how far. Yeah. So this is the current crack surface. I have computed displacement stresses and strains. I have now I kind of have to identify now the situation at the crack front, whether I compute stress intensity factors, configurational forces, other stress and strain measures, for example, the maximum circumferential stress criterion, and so on. And based on this local situation at the crack front, I would then make my decision where to go and how far. Okay, these are the blue arrows over here. Now, that is now my new crack surface, okay? This also confirms that, of course, once when we have an, um, a surface mesh, a crack surface mesh available, then, of course, it is nicely and easily possible to kind of remesh this surface mesh and, and thereby consider for some desired crack update. Okay, this this basic XFEM code, okay, for linear elastic fracture mechanics, okay, we of course went through all the benchmarks which exist in that in that context in two and three dimensions. I have only extracted these two examples here because they at least one kind of gets the feeling they are, they could be related also to our context of hydraulic fracturing somehow in terms of the geometry. So look at, look at this thing here. We have some cusp-like crack surface at the beginning. There is now rather a mode one uh, setting here and, and we can see that here the crack surface rather develops in a, in a, in a rather flat sense. Whereas over here where we have some shear setting available so then, of course, we have yeah, some curved crack surface. And, of course, somehow we can already now claim that, assume this were hydraulic fracturing, okay, which it, this test case is not, I mean, that's not the case for this test case here, but it, I'm just saying curved crack surfaces are natural, they 
kind of develop naturally. And when we now want to consider this in the context of hydraulic fracturing, then we have to later on consider fluid flows on these curved surfaces, or, or generally speaking, on this curved manifold. Okay, now the adaption to hydraulic fracturing. So let's first talk about pressurized crack, sur oh, crack surfaces. Sorry. So assume, give, assume now our crack surfaces are not longer completely stress-free, but we have some pressure P on the crack surface. I could even more generally say some stress sigma, but let's simply say some pressure P on the crack surface. Compute displacements and crack opening based on the X value. Therefore, we will need some exchange of data between the explicit crack surface mesh base and implicit description, this implicit one, based on level sets. But I'm not going into details here. Okay, and of course we can then go through another phase of verifying the code and see if it reproduces all the known uh, benchmark solutions. I mean, where we simply really can basically say we can apply any kind of stress distribution over here and then compute analytical stress intensity factors and see how good, how good this compares. Okay, so here are different pressure fields if you want. These shapes then show the correlated uh, crack openings, and yes, and over here we, we confirm that this uh, converges to the analytical values. Okay, this is another test case. You can find reference results. I have also given the references here, so if you want to check those out. Um, okay, and of course also in 3D penny-shaped crack under various situations, including like K1, K2, K3, and yeah, can. Nicely verify that your crack solver also is able to consider now for pressurized crack surfaces. And this setup, okay, it's still we are still not at hydraulic fracturing, but this setup we have used in many different contexts. Like, like in biomechanics, we had a project which was concerned with this, with this bone fracture thing, which is some surgical. Uh, procedure where the jawbone is actually broken and you can definitely <coughs> say we will have some pressures that we will exert here also within the crack surfaces. This is a recent project in, uh, in aortic dissection where you know the, 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 the tissues in the aorta are kind of delaminating due to some blood flow entering there and also exerting some, some pressure and, and, and thereby leading to some rupture of, of the tissue. Okay, also this you can nicely handle with this, uh, with this frame, so some, something related to dam safety where we have some initial crack over here, water entering there, and of course again exerting uh, pressure on the crack surface. And of course hydraulic fracturing also is kind of in the same direction at least, and we have had a project in geothermal energy where the situation is quite different to, to what we have seen here many times in hydrocarbons. So we don't usually have like many fractures and, um, and so on. So that the rock is dense and brittle. We typically assume only one fracture surface and there are some similarities but also some differences. Okay, let's talk about how do we now actually obtain those pressure profiles? We know that given a pressure profile, we are, can do a good job in you know, computing the response of the structure and also advance, advancing the crack. But of course the question is, how, where do I really get the, crack, uh, the, the pressure profiles from? And of course somehow from, from fluid models. Um, so the fluid model has now to be solved on the curved crack surface. Okay. So this whole context is the context of solving partial differential equations on manifolds. Yeah. It is addressed in the frame of tangential differential calculus and their classical operators are replaced by their tangential counterparts. So this is a classical gradient and this is a surface gradient. If this is a divergence operator, then this is the surface divergence. If this is Laplace, then this is now the laplace Beltrami operator. Yeah? Classical identities like divergence theorems, product rule, chain rule, and so on also extend to manifolds. So it's a very, very beautiful 
theoretical background to formulate now models on curved surfaces. And also for the discretization, we have really nice and, and, and proven tools available, so something which we can label the surface FEM, where we now need, of course, some surface mesh. We introduce function spaces <coughs> and a manifold, and we derive a weak form, but this is really all so closely related to standard FEM, yeah? Okay. Now the question is, of course, what kind of fluid model do I want to solve now? Okay. I have just shown you the model hierarchy, hierarchy we can think of, okay, starting maybe with something like the most general case, okay, we want to solve incompressible Navier-Stokes flow on some manifold, okay, probably not in hydraulic fracturing, but theoretically that can be an interesting topic and we can easily provide an, provide an answer for this, or incompressible Stokes flow. Some advection diffusion models, okay, here I just took this 2D picture, so now we solve the problem on this circle, okay, so the initial distribution is here, it is transported and then thereby diffused and in the end looks, looks like this. Or Laplace Beltrami type of equations, and that is now where one can really connect immediately to things that, that everybody here uh, is really doing and aware of, I mean, for example, we can generalize the Reynolds equation to be solved on a curved crack surface. Or think of other more simplified models. So the message here is models for, for the flat case extend naturally to the curved case. And I put this here in these things because, okay, of course, I'm not saying it's not hard work to implement it somehow, but, but the theory is very nice and... and um, Yes, and, and there, is, there is a straightforward path to do this. Okay, for example, now look at the Reynolds equation, which we typically write in this way for the flat case, and which re re relates the crack width and the pressure. So, in our case, we solve this equation on the surface mesh, with, which is another good thing which is another good thing that we have this hybrid explicit implicit description available because now we prefer for solving this fluid model we prefer the explicit description based on the correct surface mesh right and also we know that, that now typically we write it like this for the flat case in fact for the curved case now on the curved correct surface we should yeah, rather use here the surface gradient and then leading to the Laplace Beltrami operator in the Reynolds equation, okay? Okay, this is now the, the, the coupling approach. So we have the fluid flow, here goes the XFEM part and we extract the crack width. Okay, we have some iteration loop which needs to be converged out and then we will characterize the situation at the crack tip and realize our crack update. And in, in these steps for the fluid flow and over here to characterize the situation at the crack front and advance the crack, we use the explicit, explicit description and in this region over here goes the implicit description. Okay. We found that when we implemented this and, and verified the typical, the typical benchmarks, so we found that in our case this is not always as robust as we wanted it to be also in the context of the, of the project that we were having, we found that we have basically often too less data to really justify for, for all these model phenomena. So we were thinking of coming up with a, with a simpler model where we rather say, okay, instead of letting the whole question of which REAM is relevant and so on being an outcome of, of, the, of the code, let us rather want to prescribe certain pressure profiles but I think I will have to rush a little bit through this um, so where we would rather where we kind of where the task would be like okay we assume that this is our that this would be our pressure distribution in 1D and we want to project this now onto this curved surface assuming that this is the injection point and that this is the crack front and we can do this also based on some Laplace Beltrami kind computations where we develop some uh, dimensionless coordinate system and so on. Okay. Of course, we would not say that you kind of have to only prescribe one certain typical pressure distribution. You can basically mix it up based on some knowledge that you hopefully have. 
And um, yeah, but, but in the end, the logic is that you prescribe somehow the, the pressure profiles in, in the, for the 1D situation that you project this onto the curved crack surface and, and then advance your computation. I think I, I, I will just now jump to the, to the conclusions. Okay, these, these are some verifications that we made. So the main points I wanted to address here, so I wanted to point out what XFAM is. Okay, the XFAM extends the approximation space to capture discontinuities and singularities without the meshing effort. So you really save only the, mesh, the meshing effort, okay? There is a lot that remains. So it does not include a model for propagation or crack surface update. Yeah? In that sense, you will face problems when you have crack merging or branching in three dimensions, for example. I also discussed models for flat domains extended to curved. I mentioned that models for flat domains extend to curved crack surfaces naturally. Okay, This is the whole context of PDEs on manifolds. But therefore, of course, you would need a crack surface mesh, and that is fortunately available in our XFAM approach. Yes, then I was short on this, on this simplified model where we rather prescribe pressure profiles and compute the loading factors. And uh, you may, during the simulation, change or mix pressure profiles, I could say, as you want, but I'm not saying this is a natural outcome of the method, but you rather have to put it in there based on some knowledge that you may have. Okay, and this is the end of my talk. Thank you very much. Okay, we can probably take maybe one question. So, I mean, I'm not sure if, if when you do, you know, when you have the hexagon and you couple, uh, you have, within the crack, you have a very really small system of equations leading to the, the fluid flow. And that's yeah. coupled to a whole lot of mesh nodes that are, that's a much bigger. Right? Yes, that's right. So when you're coupling, I mean, there's a temptation to collapse everything to a sort of numerical Green's function and do everything in the plane, you know. Or do you actually have these few nodes in the plane act, talking to all the um, mesh points, mm. which is now like the tail wagging the dog and, and, and in, in a computational sense. Have you... Is that what you have to do in well, the coupling? And what is your view on how to actually solve that very efficiently? Okay, so the first thing is I think, well, if you go towards this kind of boundary element method approach that you were just pointing at, then of course you always need these severe assumptions of having like infinite domains and these kind of things, which in many of our fields of application are simply not there. So in that sense, I think we have to stick to a finite element context. In terms of efficiency and coding time, of course, this is, this is an issue. Like, I would say we are uh, kind of happy with, with, the, with the time that we need in the, in the presence of one crack surface. But imagine now that we have maybe, I don't know, 20, 30 crack surfaces. I, then, of course, this will be quite a challenge. But of course, we did not go at any stage through all through this kind of effort where you would say you try a parallelization and you try to... to exactly, and then you try to really... Uh, because this will, of course, mean a lot of implementation effort and so on, and we haven't gone through this uh, so far. I'm sure there's other questions we'll leave to the break, so thank you very much. <laughs>